down the road in their whatever vintage Rolls Royce it was, and they're saying you know, off their heads more or less. Um, you know, this is t- this is the age that we're in. I mean, it's unfortunate, um, but people are upset, as uh, Gerald Salente says. When you have nothing to lose, people lose it. Yep, absolutely. And that's, yep. You know, the point where where we're at. Unfortunately, um, I don't see it getting a whole lot better. I think this recovery that uh, the mainstream financial press keeps talking about is more of an illusion. I'm not saying there aren't some areas that probably are recovering. There probably are. The, and the fact, I mean, I want to be factual, there is $2 trillion basically sitting on the sidelines from corporate America. I mean, there's a lot of cashed up corporations right now, but they're afraid to spend that money, in my view, because they really, you know, don't know, um, you know how good this recovery is. Is the consumer out there uh, vibrant enough to be able to keep spending? And the answer is a lot of them know. They can't. They're underwater on their mortgage or they have credit card issues. I mean, the real unemployment rate is up 10%. So how they're going to play out is going to be um, a very much of a tightening of the belt of the average American. Yep. And I think, uh, and excuse me all for being a bit derogatory, but I really look at it from a longer-term perspective as being a good thing. I think, generally speaking, probably not anyone on this call, but generally speaking on the uh, on the American condition, I think we've been overfed and undereducated, and I think it's about time that we ate more nutritiously and fed our minds more uh, intellectual food that was really palatable to a thinking population rather than a following population. I'll digress for a moment. I'm not a big Ralph Nader fan, although I do admire a great deal what he's done. I think he's a little misguided on this politics, but uh, I think his heart is definitely in the right place, and some of his ideas are very sound. You know, I ran into uh, one of his um, gatherings by accident. I was living in Northern California at the time, and it happened to be like the solar something day, and I happened to be up at this place and was doing a lot of solar work. And so in Tool's... uh, Ralph Nader, and I listened to his whole speech, which was rather inspiring, by the way, and he made this statement early on in the speech, and I've always remembered it. He said when he got home from school one day, his father asked him, and what did he learn in school that day? And then he goes on to say, did you learn to think or did you learn to believe? And I always remember that because our kids today are taught to believe, to believe, you know, authority knows better than they do. There's always an expert that knows more than they do and yep. on and on. What yep. you really want to teach anyone is how to think. You want to teach them logic. You want to teach them how to determine, you know, what is true and what is false. And that's one of the great things about the Internet is that it really is a free market. But unfortunately, people that aren't trained in logic, <clears throat> deductive reasoning, they use the dialectic process that, you know, if we all agree it's got to be right, which is incorrect and inaccurate and illogical, um, they could go to a website and really be buffaloed, if you will, on somebody that might sound very good or be very articulate, but their facts are wrong. So I know that beat that one to death. Why don't we take another question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I hear what you're saying about the uh, curriculum within the U.S. here, and I'm sure other countries too, and... Uh, about four years ago, I asked uh, the economics uh, teacher uh, at a high school I used to work at, um, you know, I asked him uh, or her, do you ever uh, um, teach students much about uh, the properties of gold and silver and, and how it plays in with the, you know, overall aspect? And I, I still remember this, just like you had said, uh, something that you remembered uh, out of the CFTC meeting, uh, the SEC and CME group, I caught an a interview that you did a while back. Um, and, uh, and I, it'll stick to this in my mind to this day. She, she replied back to me. She says, uh, um, what am I supposed to tell them? It's yellow and it's heavy. I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, we're definitely on square zero here. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I know what you mean there. Um, I guess, uh, uh, some uh, queries here. Um, that I had written down previously here, um, and if you could just briefly touch on these, because I know time is uh, of, a, of a certain constraint here. Um, the first inquiry, and, and you could just briefly touch if you'd like. Um, first ones, we had options expiry today, closed, uh, and then it uh, um, closes uh, completely Saturday, uh, and then also the, the quarterly uh, expirations on the 31st at the end of the month here. 
Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, touch on a few of those and how you thought they went today. Well, today, I think they went as I would expect, meaning that there wasn't much movement in the market today. And the reason being is that we're in the holiday season and normally there's very quiet activity in all the markets, including the precious metals this time of year. So pretty much nothing unexpected there. But if we back up a couple months, normally what we've seen for years and years and years is on option expiration. You see both gold and silver get whacked down pretty substantially. And excuse me, that hasn't happened uh, in the past few months. You've actually seen some pretty good strength in the metal. So as I said in that little video I did in September, I believe, early September, the market is trading differently. And it really is. Um, there are definitely some strong hands in the silver and gold uh, markets, the futures markets now. And they're pretty, pretty much willing to take on uh, the other side. So I'm pretty optimistic. And as far as today is concerned, it's just one month. And I, I did n nothing unusual from my perspective on this. Okay. Um, and then also, uh, there's been a lot of talk. I know on Thursday we had... Uh, that meeting with the CFTC talking about position limits and so forth. Um, I wanted to hear uh, some of your uh, thoughts about this whole CFTC uh, speculative short positions and so forth. Well, I will certainly give you my thoughts on that. And I'm, you know, if you're asking me what I think, and I'll tell you, but it may not coincide with um, what some people you know, might want me to say or think I believe. Nonetheless, um, here it goes. For number one, you cannot manipulate a major market uh, for the long term. So I believe strongly that you cannot manipulate the main trend. And it's pretty apparent that gold and silver have been up uh, for a decade. And uh, gold in particular has really not got whacked down that badly over the last decade. Silver did get hit pretty hard during the financial crisis of 2008 when that manifested. So the trend can't be manipulated, but within that trend, you can manipulate the heck out of the market. And that happens all the time. So in other words, would gold and silver prices be higher than they are today if there wasn't the amount of selling pressure that exists in the futures market? The answer is clearly yes. Yes, it would be. How much more? No one really knows. But all markets move by up and down pressure. And buying causes upward pressure on a stock or commodity and selling causes downward pressure. For a very long time, the market doesn't care if that selling pressure is real or fictitious. The fictitious market pressure for selling has been astronomical in the silver market for years and years and years. When the hearing that took place in March of this year for the silver manipulation, you may recall those that saw it or watched it on YouTube, that one trade was roughly 25% of the silver market or the silver, annual supply of silver in one trade. Yep, I mean, yep. you have to be an absolute moron not to know that that's going to move the market down and move it down substantially. And, of course, the CFTC knows that. And there's only one purpose for doing that, and that's to move the market down. There clearly can be no other reason. If you are going to hedge your bet, you are going to trickle that trade in. You're going to make that trade over a long period of time so you don't move the market. You get the best hedge you possibly can. The only way you're going to sell a large quantity or buy a large quantity, uh, if you're <clears throat> particularly on the sell side, is to move the market one direction and one direction only. And that's exactly what happened. And this has gone on for quite some time. The only thing about you know the outcome is I don't know. I mean, no one knows, but I'm not that optimistic. My worldview is different, perhaps, than some others in the, in the silver writing space. From my own experience, I have very little faith in the powers that be. I don't believe that there are many in the uh, financial markets, in the regulatory bodies, at the uppermost end of it, to the lower end of it that are really going to impose anything with some real teeth. I mean, let's think about it for a moment. If we really wanted to have uh, this market cleaned up, the laws that already exist are sufficient to take care of the problem, and they haven't done a damn thing. So it will reenact or enact or put a little more grip into the laws that exist. Is that going to make it better? It might, and I hope it does. 
but I have my doubts. And what I did read, I didn't have read everything, was the, <clears throat> the fine print. In other words, these are always lawyers, and they always have their little weasel clauses. And it looked to me like the proposal was that, you know, they're going to change the limits, and they're going to give it, you know, in the spot month, which, by the way, already exists. And then they're going to, you know, in fact, 25% of the open interest of the back months and on and on with kind of this gobbledygook. And then you read further, it talks about the, you know, legitimate, you know, commercial interest. Well, the commercial interests are what's causing all the problems. And the commercial interests aren't necessarily the miners of silver. Most primary silver miners don't hedge at all. But that's only 25% of the market. 75% of the market is your RTZs, your BHPs, it's your large base metal miners. And those guys turn their book over to the bullion banks. And the bullion banks are running the books for the base metal miners, and they're shorting the heck out of the silver market. And if they get some kind of an exemption, then this whole thing has been for naught, as far as I'm concerned. In other words, it's been an exercise in futility. Yet, you're probably not going to see that unless you read it very, very carefully. Now, I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but you ask me what my thoughts are, and this is exactly the way I'm thinking about it. Uh, if they put some real teeth in it and they make it a level playing field for everybody, great. But as it exists now, if you are a hedger, which means you're a bullion bank, um, or that that kind of a situation, it's not just bullion banks, I want to be clear, you could be, you know, RTZ maybe runs their own book. I don't know for a fact, but I believe that they turn it over to some kind of banking entity to do it for them. But regardless, they would be considered a commercial, and they are. I mean, they're a big mining house, and certainly they have the right to um, come into the market as commercial. But a commercial gets a discount. They only have to put up 70% of the funds that a speculator does. So their work of 70 cents does the work of everybody else's dollar. And then on top of that, they're allowed to hedge up the kazoo. I mean, they can sell forward whatever amount of silver they feel like, naked or not. And again, so I have to labor that. So my hope is that it does a great deal of good. The reality of what I think I don't think it's going to. I think it, I don't think it's going to do that much. Is what I believe. I really don't. I wish it would. I, I hope it does, but I, I doubt. I doubt it will. Okay. Um, well, uh, I wanted to uh, do something real quick here because uh, I've seen a few uh, comments uh, in the uh, text board here in the room itself. Um, I guess a lot of people are having a hard time uh, digesting that this is an actual phone call because <laughs> I, 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 like I said, I'm shocked myself. Uh, you know, because I know you're such a busy man and so forth. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, just to clear up any kind of confusion, uh, if you wouldn't mind for us, Mr. Morgan, just to say uh, maybe uh, hello, everyone. How you doing in the Silver and Gold Equals Freedom Room tonight? Uh, hello, everyone. How you doing? The what? <laughs> Silver and Gold Equals Freedom Room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how are you like that? Yeah, I mean, the whole premise of the hard money movement, and I like to call it the honest money movement, is, is basically that. And maybe as we warm up everyone, I should let you know what my mission statement is, because it may surprise you, it may not, but my mission statement is to teach and empower people to understand the benefits of an honest financial system. So gold and silver are not actually in my mission statement, although they're a very important part of my mission statement. But, you know, we have a level playing field for everybody, as I just outlined on just a small aspect of the silver market, the futures market, uh, and an important part, of course. We would have a far, far better, you know, far, far better country, far, far better world, really. But uh, that's not the situation we find ourselves in. And, of course, it's been one of my missions in life to do what I can to correct the situation. Okay. Um, well, maybe just to touch on a few uh, few key points, and you know, maybe about uh, I don't some some of these questions may be uh, impossible to <laughs> have an inquiry in uh, say a minute or two. But if anything, just so we could kind of move it along a little bit, as uh, I know uh, I know you're a very busy man, and um, and that's what I picked up on you quite a few times. Is uh, you know, I've it seems like when you're in the chat rooms and so forth. Uh, when you talk to people, it's like um, you get a different perspective with who they are, and it's 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 very uh, um, pleasing to me to know that.